So how do delays and timing in the nervous system function? How do you get a delay from between one event and another if you want to control a muscle? Or how do you detect the difference between uh, two incoming events, between a bar in one location on the retina and another, or between sounds that come in at a slightly different time? So the simplest way is just to have different length axons. So one long axon is going to be a lot slower than a short axon. The lower one here is much shorter. What about delay lines or delay line circuits? Um, what I'm going to do is illustrate a circuit in which we have two bar cells, bar cells on two locations on the fovea. So here's the circle represents the fovea. And if we have a bar that's in one location at one time, and then later it's in another location, and later still it's in a third location at time one, time two, and time three, that represents movement. So this person, it's as if this person is watching and it sees a bar um, moving from one location to another. So how is that encoded? We're going to do a delay line between just two of those locations. I'm going to draw three spots of light, which together could make up a bar with three off-center ganglion cells, off-center on surround, going to a single neuron. And that neuron is going to respond to a bar in that location on the fovea. And we'll call it neuron G. We'll have a second one that is sensitive to a bar in a different location on the fovea, again, with input coming from three simple cortical, uh, three ganglion cells, off center ganglion cells, to our simple cortical neuron. Okay, now those need to connect up to another cell, we'll call it M, and we want M to fire action potentials only if it gets a bar first in one location, then another. So we'll need for that an interneuron that is inhibitory to M. And that uh, interneuron from cell G um, needs to inhibit M. And then down below from H, we want to respond to any delay. I'm calling it 10 milliseconds here, but it could be different. And over on the right here, I'm showing the um, charge in M in response to this in millivolts with time as the x-axis. And the first point is that that first circuit, that first thing getting to M is an inhibitory, a fast ionotropic inhibitory circuit, uh, sorry, a uh, signal. So we need a neurotransmitter that, for example, opens potassium channels or uh, allowing potassium out or chloride in. And that's going to be the first time reaching M for a uh, postsynaptic potential after the start time. That's what I'm showing here. And what we'd see is after a bit of a delay, a decrease uh, in the charge in millivolts. The next thing that we'll get to our cell M is a slow metabotropic response. So the action potential will get there at the same speed, but it's a slow metabotropic and excitatory receptor. So it's going to take longer for it to go up, and it'll go on for at least as long and probably longer than the fast inhibitory response. None of these bring us to threshold. The green dashed line here is threshold, and we, have, we, we don't get to threshold from this. Our second neuron, H, is a fast ionotropic response. That fast ionotropic response is going to depolarize cell M. And so we're going to have a delay, our 10 millisecond delay, or whatever we decided we want it to be, for a postsynaptic potential. So we have a delay to, for that fast ionotropic response, and then a rise, and then a drop. If we add all these together, we'll get to threshold. We'll initially go down, and then we'll go up, and that'll give us an action potential. So that only happens if we have input from G followed by input from H. We have initial drop. The next question is, why do we need that inhibitory portion? So let me start drawing this over again, and I'll talk about why the inhibition. Okay, notice that G going with the slow metabotropic receptor plus the fast ionotropic receptor from H ought to be enough to give us an action potential. The problem is, that won't work if the bar stays at G. 
So let's see what would happen if the bar stayed at G and then a new bar appeared at H, would we still get an action potential in M? So here's the same circuit I drew before. We have a fast ionotropic excitatory from H, fast ionotropic inhibitory from I, and a slow metabotropic excitatory from G. So here's the inhibitory circuit the slow metabotropic and the fast ionotropic. So what that gives us um, is going to depend upon whether that bar stays at G or whether it's first at G and then at H. So what happens if there's a bar at both G and H at the same time? Okay, so we'll get our initial inhibition, of course. We'll get our delayed excitatory signal from uh, G and we'll also get the excitatory sim signal with a delay from H. Okay, but if that signal, if that bar stays at G, we're going to get repeated input. Okay, that bar is still there so we get inhibi inhibitory signal after inhibitory signal after inhibitory signal. And that will block Okay, and this line's not quite right, let me erase that one. We'll get an inhibition, a rise, and then an inhibition. They all cancel out, and we don't get enough of a depolarization to get an action potential. So that continued inhibition is enough to keep our cell just below threshold. Um, so if the bar doesn't disappear from G and then appear again at the location for H, there's no action potential. Okay, so you may want to slow this down and go through it again. My apologies for the jerky motion and slant.